but there is a sense that they that, that they have a kind of uh, uh, the resonance and you know ongoing interest. That, yeah. That uh, I think also artists understand what they're doing as being in a kind of citational kind of space. Mm -hmm. Like you know, to be an artist is is necessary to, to cite or or whatever can cannibalize, regur not regurgitate, but whatever can transform other artists mm -hmm. and to, to, to be in dialogue with the history of art. You know, which I think literature always has been, and good literature always has been too, but I think there's much less of an understanding of that within the world of, of publishing. That, that seems to have been swept aside for this kind of, whatever, um, aesthetic of self-expression, you know, which is just totally irrelevant. I mean, Kathy said, you know, I wrote in order to affirm and reaffirm that I have absolutely nothing to say. Yeah. It's not about, you know, you've got something to say on the radio or whatever. It's uh -huh. you know, not what literature's there for. I think it's, it's much more interesting than that. Yeah, so, it's what, I mean, it's, it's, it's what Elliot wrote at the top of the wasteland before cutting it. You know, you do the police in different, different voices. voices. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, but it, you know, obviously, and I think also in the art world. I mean, when I first read Remainder, and, I, and I, you know, there's, there's there was a, there was a cult following around the book, and I have to admit, I I probably drank the Kool Aid along with a lot of people because I thought it was such a fantastically realized project, um, and it did remind me of a lot of things that were that were you know very much in the air in the art world and, ha and had been for a long time. But you know, that 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 you then subsequently pick up on and see, um, especially the kind of appropriative strategies that you use. I mean, I, that, it's de rigueur, in, I think, in art now. And, has been since the '80s and goes yeah. back to the to the notion of the ready-made. Um, yeah. And um, but did, when you were functioning in the art world, I'll, I'll put it that way. Did you were you were you did you consider yourself as a marooned writer or yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. an artist? So so in about '99, I, I was really interested through people like um, Marinetti and Breton, and I mean all the way up to people like Guy Debord. I'm just really interested in the history of the avant-garde <coughs> because it's a place where literature, visual art, and politics kind of triangulate, always, whether it's right or left, that these things always kind of come together, you know, from the lettrists or the dadaists or everyone, you know, it's this kind of interesting hybrid space. And then I was interested in manifestos, the idea of the man the cultural manifesto, what a fantastic type of document this is and how it absolutely belongs to the early 20th century. And, and, and um, Marinetti's is, is the best one, hands down, you know, his futurist one, it's just, it's just brilliant. Um, but then I kind of wrote this manifesto. I was reading a lot of kind of Blanchot and Derrida and thinking about death as a meme within writing, space of death, space of writing. And, um, and so I wrote this almost like a pastiche. I mean, there were lots of stolen lines from, from Blanchot and from Marinetti kind of all put together and just distributed around the art world as an experiment. How are people going to respond to this? And straight away, galleries were saying, right, this is conceptual art that you're doing. So have an exhibition. We'll give you know, I, was, I was like, great, OK, you know, fine. And then I, you know, I also really like Kafka and Burroughs and this whole idea of bureaucracies. And so I appointed committees and subcommittees of, of real people, philosophers and writers. And mm -hmm. you know, it becomes this kind of structure and, and we start investigating other artists and making reports and setting up propaganda units and expelling people we don't like and that kind of thing. <laughs> and it's, I, I mean, it's obviously there's a lot of, um, it's like Duchamp's bicycle wheel, it's broken. I mean, the, the, the avant-garde cannot exist now in the same way as it existed then, but knowing that makes it in a way more interesting to kind of uh, fish, you know, inauthenticity or whatever you call it, um, de, de clip, derive, you know, yeah. built into it, décalage, built into it, um, right from the off. And, but anyhow, most of the, the, the projects that the INS, the International Necronautical Society, as this kind of hybrid fiction was, that isn't a fiction, was called, you know, they took place in art museums and institutions, but for me they were totally literary projects. I mean, so the, the one with the radio was about, it was about Burroughs, it was about Schwitters, uh, it, was, it, was, it was about writing, we were putting text on the wall and reconfiguring mm -hmm. it, it was a kind of, almost like a, a mise-en-scene of what writing is. And yet art is the space where you can do this. I mean, there, I can't imagine any other space where you could say I need $50,000 and radio equipment and a staff of 20 in 10 days, yeah. you know, and it's no good for anything, you know, you can't buy it, <laughs> you know, it's just that it needs to be done, mm -hmm. you know, it is an operation within the symbolic order, which is kind of literally what we, you know, said on our application for the money for, and, and you know, art is a space where you can do that, which I think is very, um, it's almost like, you know, so for me, literature kind of went via art in order to come back yeah. and happen as literature, I had to make that detour, 
and, and it was a very fruitful one, and I'm very happy to have had to so be forced to. into that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's interesting that it also that that yeah, that was that was a, a, a place in Paris that published the, the publisher remember yeah. the first time. There, someone called Remainder. I think it's a, a great line, the best French novel in English. Yeah, and, it's uh, a very nice line because they also said it's the only one. So it's uh, necessary, no, also the worst. So congratulations, <laughs> <Yeah>. you're <laughs> at the top, <laughs> at the bottom, the best and worst French novel ever written in English. Yeah, I suppose Remainder in particular is is very French. I mean, it's all is is very indebted to like Rob Grier and. And that, especially the whole nouveau roman thing, but you know Beckett. I mean, I guess he's kind of French, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, but remained as much. Uh, sorry, C is much more German, really. I mean, yeah, I remember you had a, you, really you had said when, or, when when you were uh, right before C came out, you, you said that well, my last novel was the French novel. This, <laughs> this one German, is the German so, novel. It's a big Swedish one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to come back to the Danish, to the art thing, I mean, I remember when somebody I, I used to read, you know, all the reviews really anxiously and, and one of the early reviews said yeah this is the, the hero of remainder is a conceptual artist the whole thing is a parable of art and i said to this this friend and and, and in fact later collaborator of mine in our projects rob dickinson whose art is all about reenactments i said what do you think of this this sounds like a quite good take on it he said no absolutely wrong because if the hero of Remainder were an artist, the whole book would just be a tay at the office right i mean it's what artists do and i think it's quite important that he's not and in C, there isn't a kind of um, a discipline that exists for for their for what they have to do. I mean, I think at one point Serge is even um, the, the narrator of Remainder is even saying, you know, me and my gang, we were like um, the devotees of a religion that hadn't yet been named because the Messiah had not yet come and kind of revealed yeah. themselves. But we were there, you know. And in a way, so is Serge. I mean, almost like if they were artists, that would that would almost close the whole thing off and, mm -hmm. and, and arrest it, and that would be a pity. Well, that's one thing that, that really strongly, I mean, when I, I reread Remainder pretty recently, and it, and, uh, and it was after reading uh, and writing about C, uh, but, but my, I, 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 there were so many things that I hadn't noticed that were, that were little uh, uh, marks back and forth between the novels. There's, a, I think, Scarab is a word that, Scarab, that yeah. sends um, Naz, um, the, the unnamed protagonist, um, yeah. A facilitator. Oh, and it, uh, it remains the word. The liver smells like yeah, cordite. Yeah, the liver smelling like cordite. Serge smells joke. cordite and see, he says it smells like liver. And yeah. Yeah, those were just little in jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but but the remainder you wrote relatively quickly, I think, right? Remainder was kind of simple. I mean, I, I had the idea, it's a very simple idea. I mean, a, a set of escalations from. <clears throat> There's this French novel by, um, by Pierre Albert Biro called Grabanola. And, and it's really fantastic, and, and um, it's about a kind of proto-Leopold Bloom figure who just kind of dawdles around Paris. But there's one scene where he, um, he notices one day it's like a clock or, or a trinket on his mantelpiece is not straight, and he goes to straighten it, and he realizes it's his mantelpiece that's not straight, so he gets about fixing it. Then he realizes that it's actually the foundations of his house are wrong, so he gets diggers and he's digging it up. Then he realizes it's the whole street, so he's like digging up the street and all the other houses are falling down. Then he realizes the earth itself is not quite right, so he's setting off bombs under the San Andreas Fault uh, or whatever and causing earthquakes. And so there's, it, within four escalations, you go from um, crooked, crooked clock yeah, to total global annihilation. Yeah. And, and it's, very, it's very simple. And it's kind of the same with Remainder. I mean, he has this. He sees a crack in the wall, has this like total whatever Proust moment of deja vu, and says, I want to reenact that, and I want to expand the space to be a whole house and the whole street, and, and, and to up the kind of control of it so that he can do anything. He can kill people, and, and you know, I mean, to the point of, of, of having the, the switch of life and death. But it only takes kind of, again, like I think it's about four escalations from yeah, reconstructing the crack to being a mass murderer, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, but it's a very simple idea, so once I kind of had it, it kind of went quite quickly. Yeah. yeah. And, you've, and you, you sort of, once, once you had the original kind of impulse to, to you know, have this unnamed protagonist uh, stage a reenactment of some like, very fleeting sort of memory that he has. It's not even really clear how much it's a memory exactly. Yeah. Um, it could be one of those priest memories where you collage it yeah. and then remember it as though it were real. You really you you took you took it to its logical 
to its logical extreme, but then found a way to circle the, the novel entirely back with the, with the idea. Well, it kind of flips over into authenticity as well. So he's, he's going to these elaborate lengths. He feels inauthentic. So he wants, he has a memory and says that was authentic. Whatever that was, it was real. So I've got to reconstruct it in order to kind of accede to an imagined authenticity. And of course, it's a paradox. It doesn't work because it just makes it more and more inauthentic. But then in the most highly constructed event, the simulated bank heist, that he wants to be so realistic, he has it in a real bank without telling the people that they're going to do a bank reenactment. Because mm -hmm. he's found out, and this is true, that bank staff are so highly trained. What, about what to do in a bank heist, that it already is a reenactment, you know, when they, they... And the robbers know this, and they know they know they know. Yeah, it's so a game it's of true. Everyone action, knows. reaction, action. The only thing that makes bank heists go wrong is when, you know, the little old lady starts screaming, or a have-a-go hero jumps one of them, and everyone doesn't want that, because it's mm -hmm. going off, off script. Anyhow, so he moves it into the... And, and, and it does go off script, and people start getting killed. And this, for him, is a fantastic moment, because it's... He, he's, he's flipped back into... The event, to use this kind of Baduan term, the real event has erupted yeah, out, of the, out of the unreal. Yeah. I got the idea totally from this is what happens at the end of Crash, right? He's, he's re Ballard's Crash, he's reenacting all these car crashes, and he's going to do the greatest car crash ever with Elizabeth Taylor at the moment of orgasm. He gets it ever so slightly wrong and misses her car and dies. And, um, and so it's a real crash. Mm -hmm. He gets what he wanted by not getting what he tried. Yeah. to get, I mean, yeah. the, the real erupts. And it's always this move into violence as well, I think. Violence is really important in all of this. How is the, uh, uh, I just ask a couple more questions because we'll, we'll take questions to the audience, but um, how is the, uh, it, it's being made into a film, how, is that progressing? How is that coming along? Yeah, that, that's progressing. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's progressing. I mean, <laughs> glaciers progress, right? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, this is, this, no, this is, um, Omar Fast is writing the script, who's a fantastic artist whose work I really admire. And it's all about, I mean, he, you know, he's on the same page totally. It's all about mediation, violence, repetition, trauma. I mean, this is what all of his, he's got, got, he's got work at the Guggenheim at the moment. He's a fantastic artist. Um, so he's um, going to be the director of it, and he's writing the screenplay. He is writing the screenplay. Yeah. Okay. So um, it, it's it's uh, you know it's going very well. These things just take a very 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 long time mm -hmm. to come to um, you know to a cinema near you. Is there any is there any film interest in see? I think it's too um, it's too high budget. Once you've got aeroplanes and stuff in World War One, the 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 um, the the, uh, the budget becomes enormous, and then they definitely want. Sentimental humanism. They don't want. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to. Sort of <laughs> <necrophilic laughs> <laughs> okay, ejaculating off the back of planes <laughs> while shooting up heroin. They yeah. want, you know, atonement or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I, like, like, I think I'd make a good cartoon. <laughs> a cartoon movie. I think that's a great idea. idea. Yeah, like Linklater did it or something. Uh -huh. like the, um, it's Philip K. Dick mm -hmm. adaptation. Although they got people to act, they got Keanu to act, right? And then <laughs> overdrew it. Yeah, I think the cartoon's kind of better. <laughs> cartoon dogs. I mean, they, they yeah, yeah, somehow. Yeah. Um, and you've, I, I imagine that being in, a, 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 you've been in New York now since uh, January, I think, right? Yeah. Teaching at Columbia, um, as well as writing here. Um, yeah, for which I'm hugely grateful. This is a fantastic place to write. I have phoned them up just asking for a ticket, a reader's ticket. And they said, they said, we're huge fans of yours. We love that movie, The Visitor. <laughs> the, uh, I guess, I mean, I, it, in a weird way, I guess coming to New York was probably a relief after, after C had become such a kind of media event in the fall when it was shortlisted for the Booker. And um, there was a bit of a, 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 a the British offer wagering on many, many events, and among them is the, the, the Booker Prize. Um, and uh, your book was shortlisted, and it immediately the, the odds plunged on it and became something of a, uh, of a media story before the, uh, the wagering was, was shut down on it. But it must have actually been kind of a relief to get, get away from that. Um, was it, was it, do, you, do you feel like there was, that that was a, a, a difficult period to go through? Or was it arduous and kind of having to do so much media around the yeah. prize? Or, and having the expectations that uh, be so great for it winning the prize? Yeah, it's kind of a relief when it didn't I mean, it, it was, um, 
I mean, it's great for the book, you know, because, I mean, the sad thing is that prizes like that and exponentially increase the number of people reading it. Yeah. Which is kind of frustrating to think, why are you reading what Ducky Archive published? It's great. You're not reviewing books press. They're doing really interesting novels. You know, but that's the way, you know, the, this is the power of the media. And so I guess, I guess kind of that's a good thing. But it's very, it's kind of ironic because, you know, the book is so much about media. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then it becomes a subject of media. But then once you're in that kind of more mainstream media space, they don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about your feelings and emotions and stuff. Yeah. And, and, and see the book as this kind of self-expression, which, which, you know, which is precisely not what's going on. It's much, much you know, it's about framing media and all this other stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a kind of odd, paradoxical and frustrating situation to be in. Yeah. Yeah. But well, it's good to have you in New York, and you're, you're going to uh, you, you'll you'll make it a, a regular return. I think. I hope. I hope so. Yes, I love New York. It's it's great. Thing. And is it is it uh, you you've never taught in a writing program before? Is that correct? It's your no, first time. I've always kind of shied away from it. I think Columbia is kind of I don't know if it's unique, but it's it, it's very good in that I think there is a real kind of you know the same way as we were talking about in in um in art schools, the default mode is the kind of understanding that that you're engaging with the history of art and, and this is the kind of the content and this is the, the task and I think Columbia works like that a lot. I mean we read a lot of books and and um, there's no expectation um, to kind of say this is how you write and certainly not to kind of say this is how you express yourself. Um, you know it, it seems to be very much about um, you know the self being given over to the networks of language and Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that's great. And I mean, there's not just where I'm coming from. There's great people there like Ben Marcus and Shelley Jackson, whose work I really, you know, admire. Who are that's where they're coming from too. So I don't know how unique that is, but I think it's apparently Brown is very good as well. I've heard good things about that. Mm -hmm. But it's anyhow, it's it's really fun to be there, and uh, it's fun to be in New York. Okay. Um, we have a lot of students in the in the audience apparently. So um, why don't we see if anyone has any questions now?